Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Brooklyn Book Festival 2020, our virtual edition. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have so much, uh, such a robust schedule that I want you all to know that you can come back to the website over the next few days and week and watch programs that you couldn't catch this evening. Um, but as for this program, a blockbuster one put together for the festival by our friends at the National Book Foundation, we're very excited about it. And I just want to direct your gaze also to two important buttons right below the screen. One is one that says buy the book. Very important, show your love to the independent booksellers, but to these authors who are sharing their minds and time with you tonight. And the other one is donate. If you have the means to help the festival keep going a little bit, that's great too. Now, without further ado, we're going to go into the National Book Festival presenting an evening. And Lisa Lucas is here as our moderator this evening. Oh, goodness, here, I just... Lisa, I'm sorry, I dropped your bio. Lisa Lewis Lucas is the incoming senior vice president and publisher of Pantheon and Shockin' Books at Penguin Random House. Congratulations. And she's the current executive director of the National Book Foundation. Prior to joining the foundation, she served as the publisher of Guernica. We're very excited to have you with us and take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, so welcome everybody to the 2020 Virtual Brooklyn Book Festival. Um, this is an extraordinary event every year and I've never missed one in the history of Brooklyn Book Festival existing. And I've been involved with the festival for many, many years. And so it's really something to see it be all virtual. Um, we're proud to keep up the tradition of partnering from the National Book Foundation with the Brooklyn Book Festival to bring some of our favorite family members from the year before as we get to kicking off the 2020 long list. So we, some of our 2019 um, nominees here today and we're really excited about it. But uh, before we get there, I just wanted to really celebrate everybody at BKBF getting it done because we are familiar with um, not being able to do a public presentation and it's backbreaking work to try to pivot to something virtual. So huge thanks to Carolyn Greer to Liz Koch, to Cami Finch, and to the entire crew who transitioned this big old beast into something beautiful um, that everyone can be a part of, even if they aren't in Brooklyn today. Um, thanks for joining. A little quick bit about the National Book Foundation. Since 1950, we prevent, presented the National Book Award to honor the best literature in America. And over the past few years, we have spent a lot of time trying to make sure that these authors um, are not only celebrated on our stage and that the medallion that sits on their books is not the only way that we reach authors and readers with the work that we're celebrating. Uh, we make sure that we go into communities all around the country. We make sure that we digitally get into every community and this year the awards are gonna be for everyone. Um, a quick highlight of what we've done this past year, um, we've given over 1.4 million books to public housing authorities around the country. Uh, which we're really proud of. This year, we granted over $3.5 million to literary arts organizations around the nation who are suffering because of the pandemic, alongside our friends at CLMP and the, um, the Academy of American Poets. Um, and we work in so many different places, making sure that we put together public programming and make sure that young people have access to books. So we're really proud of that. Um, but we're always proudest of our authors that we celebrate every year. Um, and so this evening's event will feature 2019 National Book Award honored authors, Kwame Alexander, Jericho Brown, Marlon James, and Kianga Yamada Taylor. Um, please, please, once this is over, buy their books. This is a really, really important time for booksellers. Greenlight will be the bookselling partner, um, but it means a lot to authors. It means a lot to bestseller lists and to the bottom line, it means a lot. We've had this extraordinary moment of seeing all these books pop up and we gotta keep it going. So keep reading these books and keep buying them and keep making sure that the national discourse is alive and well and fed by beautiful art. Um, so for tonight's program, I will chat with the authors before opening up for some questions. Um, so feel free to pop those into the ask a question section throughout the comment and we'll try to pick out as many as we can. Um, and without further ado, I will read uh, the ceremonial reading of the bios. Kwame Alexander is the innovator in residence at the American School of London and the New York Times bestselling author of 
57 books, including Caldecott Medal and Newbery Honor winning picture book, The Undefeated, How to Read a Book, Swing, Rebound, which was shortlisted for the Carnegie Medal, and his Newbery Medal winning grade novel, middle grade novel, The Crossover. As the host of the new kids television program, Wordplay, and founding editor of Versify, an imprint of Hutton Mifflin Harcourt, he aims to change the world one word at a time. Jericho Brown, um, who we're calling Jericho tonight, is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Brown's first book, Please, won the American Book Award. His second book, The New Testament, won the Annisfeld Wolf Book Award. He is also the author of the collection, The Tradition, which was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award and the winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. His poems have appeared in BuzzFeed, The Nation, The New York Times, The New Yorker, The New Republic, all sorts of the new things, Time and the Pushcart Prize Anthology and several volumes of the Best American Poetry Anthologies. He is an associate professor and the director of the creative writing program at Emory University in Atlanta. Marlon James was born in Jamaica in 1970, approximately 10 years before me. His most recent novel, Black Redford, Red Wolf, the first novel in James's Dark Star trilogy was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award. His previous novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings was the winner of the 2015 Man Booker Prize, American Book Award and Annisfeld Wolf Book Prize for Fiction. He is also the author of the novels, John Crow's Devil and the Book of Night Women, which won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Kianga Yamada Taylor is associate professor of, the Af of African American Studies at Princeton University and the author of From Black, Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, How We Get Free, Black, Femin Black Feminism, Black Feminism, excuse me, and the Kombahi River Collective and Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Home Ownership. Thank you so much as we welcome all of these incredible panelists. I'm so excited. I'm teasing everybody because we are amongst friends. So forgive my little jokes, thought I'd keep it light. Um, but let's start off with what brought us here. So in 2019, you were all honored um, by the National Book Foundation as long listers, finalists, et cetera. Um, these books came out a while ago, right? But all of them feel exceptionally, exceptionally important to the moment that we are living through today. Um, how do you think the reception of the work that you've written back then has changed in the world that we're living in today? Who wants to go first? Marlon wants to go first. Marlon, tell me. Crap, everyone yes. wants to go first? Yes, um, you do. <laughs> um, I think certain for, for well, in two ways. And tell uh, us about, about the book first, too, since everybody's book? coming in. Oh, the book? Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Oh, Black Leopard. I'm doing what you're doing, you know, it Black Leopard. I heard that. Leopard. Uh -huh. no, um, that's just my lisp. <laughs> anyway, Black Leopard, Red Wolf is a fantasy novel set in an imaginary version of a part of the African continent, actually a part of the Sahel region. And it, what it came, best to describe it, that it came out of a fight between me and somebody about Lord of the Rings, because I was arguing that the, the films were so white. Let's just call mm -hmm. it that. And he was saying it was British and European, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, dude, Lord of the Rings isn't real. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can you can do whatever it is. And, in, and the fight, instead of just continuing the fight, it just hit me when I just write my own damn book. Um, so because it's it's... It's easy to t it's easy when you live in a society where you, you can take your myths for granted. Um, mm -hmm. When you don't have them, there's a certain foundational aspect of you, of you that's not there. And I think for me to write this novel was to imagine and reimagine, but also to consider the you know the mythologies that I didn't have growing up. And that's really kind of how that book came about. Um, mm -hmm. I I you know I've seen it. it change in readership and and how people read it since then especially particularly post black lives matter becoming a bigger thing george floyd was murdered four blocks from my house um in minneapolis and um and i think it's forced a lot of people to look at 
black art outside of this white gaze, which everybody looks at it. And once you sort of at least try to remove that, that you start to look at books, even books you've always read in a different way. So mm -hmm. I think that's that maybe was what's happening. Great. Anyone else want to comment on how readership may have changed over the past little while? So oh. I wrote The Undefeated um, for my daughter. And she'd had numerous sort of experiences in her formal schooling where she came face to face with, you know, the weight of being black. Um, and, you know, the question that as parents, I know I asked myself when she was born is at what age am I going to be, am I going to have to talk to her about uh, some of the tragedy that black people have suffered? And I asked my mother and my mother said, she'll let you know when she's ready to know about it. So it ha for it happened in fourth grade. I mean, there had been sort of these conversations, but that's when it got heavy. They had an assignment where they had to um, take colonial America and create a billboard. Mm. And, and they were in groups of three. And it was she, another black girl and a white girl, fourth graders, eight years old. And the white girl, said, let's create a billboard that says, welcome to Virginia, we love our slaves. Oh. And so there was some conflict and clash, obviously, <laughs> between the two black girls and the white girls were offended. You shouldn't be, it happened. And the teacher ended up pulling them out of class. She made the white girl apologize to my daughter and the other black girl. And she made my daughter apologize to the white girl. So I didn't understand, yeah. It's like, no, nah, that doesn't compute. So we had this big meeting at school. There was a lot of crying involved, <laughs> as you can imagine. And, and we, we immediately went home and we, 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 we let her know how proud we were for standing up and speaking out and lifting her voice. And we began to then have serious, weighty conversations about the tragedy and the triumph. And so The Undefeated became this poem about the woes and the wonder of Black people from time immemorial to now. And so in terms of the perception, in terms of the readership, oh, it completely changed this year because so many teachers, librarians, parents were figuring out that same question. How can we enter into a conversation with our young people that engages them and empowers them during this time. And I think for many of them, The Undefeated became that book. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, so my book, Race for Profit, um, it's, a book, it's a book that looks at the question of how and perhaps why uh, racial discrimination um, in the real estate market in the U.S. housing market continues even after uh, the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. And so really, how do we understand the persistence of uh, racial discrimination in housing, at least, um, after its legal uh, abolition, the abolition of discrimination? Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I think that there are, uh, one of the things that has come out in the the last couple of years, I think it's still the case uh, today, is that um, there, there has really been a precipitous drop uh, in black home ownership. Um, there's been lots of talk about the, uh, the wealth gap, the racial uh, wealth gap and uh, its link um, to home ownership. And so, you know, I think that um, it, I, I just looked at this last night, the uh, black home ownership rate is somewhere between 40 and 42 percent, which is around what it was um, in 1968 when the Fair Housing Act uh, is passed. And so I think all of these kinds of markers of black inequality in the U.S., um, the, the questions around them have been revitalized over 
uh, the last several months um, because of uh, the pandemic and because of the uh, the uprising against um, police brutality. I think in many ways, um, you know, the the readership for my book. I don't I don't think it didn't just change. It massively expanded um, over. Mm-hmm. Uh, the summer, I think that was the case with uh, a lot of books that deal with racism and and race and 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 people just really trying to figure out um, how is it that uh, black people show up um, in these uh, statistics um, disproportionately uh, mm-hmm. with death, violence, inequality police abuse and violence, you know, and I, I think that there's a, there's a corollary to the kind of growth of the right that we see amassed around Donald Trump, um, is that there is also a deep desire to understand racism and to do something about it. And I think that that has been reflected um, in a deep interest about uh, in literature and books about the experiences of African Americans, um, the experiences of Black people um, in this country in particular, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I certainly think that that what I would describe as uh, somewhat a surprising uh, reception um, for my book, which it still hasn't been a year since its publication date. I think you know, it's October 19th, um, that it has to do with the wider context of just uh, grotesque uh, racism in American society that um, can't be held beneath the surface. The, the, the pandemic has pushed everything uh, to uh, all of the contradictions of US society to the, uh, to the surface. And I think there's a desire to find out why the history of that um, and, to also figure out what can be done about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll write a book called The Tradition, which is about police violence, rape, and the natural world, and Black love, uh, which I believe in. Uh, and uh, I will say that uh, it is true that since the book has come out um, largely due to Black death, uh, the readership has widened a great deal, um, which always feels horrendous. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I um, and and I'll also say that um, I don't know. You know, I don't know about reception or what reception means. I know more people are buying and reading the book, and I have to only hope that it makes a difference to their ability to recognize beauty and love people just because they're people. Um, You know, I grew up uh, in this situation uh, of a family who thought that we treated black people good because they were black. (laughs) Um, You know, know, sometimes I feel like there's not a lot of that going on. I remember when Barack Obama was running for president, you weren't supposed to say you was vote for him because he was black, but I kept saying it. People were mad at me. Uh, I was like, he's black. (laughs) So, you know, I'm one of those old nationalist kids. Um, And I'll add to that, that, uh, that I feel, I mean, I really do feel that I exist because of poems I read when I was a very young person. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. this poem by Nika Giovanni, uh, when I die, uh, I hope no one who ever hurt me cries. And if they do, I hope their eyes fall out. (laughs) Uh, So I, you know, I exist and I am a poet because of the poems that I read when I was a young person. So I imagine uh, if my books make any difference to a life, maybe I won't get to know that in my lifetime, or maybe I won't get to know that until much later in my life, because people have to encounter them at a certain moment where they can learn from them, and then they have to grow up. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk about two things, because I think they intersect with different books. Um, so answer as you see fit. But these books all center Black people. Right. These are, you know, this is a moment, you know, it's like when I was growing up, I didn't have any of your books necessarily in easy reach, you know, in 1988, you know, I didn't have the undefeated. I didn't know where to find it. Perhaps that book did exist, but there's a volume of books that are talking about our pain and our joy. And why do you think it is important to sort of be so pronounced in centering blackness in this work? 
you know, I, I mean, I know the answer for me, but why for you is that so important? And it's different kinds of, you know, it's, you're coming at it from so many different angles. You know, Jericho, your poetry is one thing. And, and, and Kwame, you're writing for children and you're talking about fantasy in this case, Marlon. And Kanga, you're talking about, you know, really sort of academic, you know, sort of policy issues and translating them to a larger market, but, you're, but from a different perspective than we usually see them. Why are these, why are these literary acts important more broadly? Um, I'll, I'll start because I went last. <laughs> and that can be for us too. Like, why is it important for black readers? Like, it doesn't need to be like, why is it important for the whole marketplace or whatever? It's not a cynical question. It's just, why does, why does it matter to you? Well, I just think uh, we're in a situation where, I mean, it matters to me that we see ourselves and that we understand that we're all right, uh, that we exist and that we can be, that we are indeed a subject, right? That we can be looked at and loved and understood um, and lifted. Uh, and I also, I also think that, um, you know, I do think in my first two books, I very consciously never said anything about white people. Um, mm -hmm for myself, you know, uh, my books were my opportunity not to have to think about white people. And this book is actually the first time I ever directly, I mean, the whole middle section is really about white folks. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought it would be interesting for black readers to encounter white people as seen through the eyes of a black man. Uh, you know, that's why there's a poem in this book called Good White People, which is also why I never can believe I won the Pulitzer Prize. I'm like, they didn't, like, they didn't read that poem. <laughs> I, know, I know they were like, they read that first section. They were like, this is good. That'll do. Uh, they were on a deadline. It was COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I snuck it through. And um, I'm really glad about that because uh, I understand that you know, we are a part of the of the perspective. There's a perspective, and our perspective is a part of that, of that perspective. And I also think that um, you know, this is the first time that so many white people have become aware of the fact that the people they thought were their black friends are not their black friends. You know, the reason why after George Floyd uh, was murdered, we got so many text messages from people who never text us. It's because somebody had told white people, text your black friends and see if they're okay. And then white people scrolled through their phone and were like, oh shit, what, what, who do I text? Like I saw Jericho in June. <laughs> Let me try this Negro. Do you know what I'm saying? And, um, and you, don't, you don't really realize how much you don't know about folk or how much right. folk Right. I mean, you know, you, you at people's job, you spend a lot of time with folk at your job and you realize I actually don't know if you have kids. I actually don't know what kind of music you listen to. Um, and so I think something about the work that we're doing, although it's not the first time it's ever been done, but something in this moment is allowing uh, Black people the opportunity to be seen more fully by one another, because, you know, we will eat our own stereotypes. Um, and obviously by other folk, you know, for whatever reasons, for obvious reasons, racism, um, not been able to understand us as, as human beings. Um, I got to second that whole thing. I, you know, I, I did get the emails. Nobody did the phone call because they didn't want to- Did you get the Venmo? The did what? Did you get the Venmos? Did people send you money? No, I didn't get the Venmo, but- I, I got like get... 80 bucks. No, I will take the reparations. Um, but no, but so yeah, there was a lot of that. But for me, um, the, what I could remember, all I can remember is as a fan of, a of, of, longtime fan of fantasy and a longtime fan of historical fiction. And to me, fantasy is, is just an imagined version of historical fiction. If you're going to be a black person or a brown person who's a fan of that kind of genre, you have to come to terms with never being in it. And when we when we read those books, we kind of double read them. We can read them for the we can read them for the story. We can read them for the action, but we also read them as outsiders because we're not part of it. Um, you know, I I can barely remember what Mansfield Park and Sandy Turner are about because I'm still thinking, but that black girl, what happened to that person? And I'm sure something nice happened in those. Well, maybe it's Jane Austen, maybe not, but um. It's 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 a sort of uh, it's trying to write the type of stories 
for me, the stories of what Tony Morrison said, right? The stories you want to read. And um, and I think it's particularly with, with fantasy. The fact is there there is no question with all the stuff, all the, the ground that we have always broken with fantasy and sci-fi. You know, Afrofuturism didn't start in 2006. Um, you know, it's it's but with all of that, there is there is still this sort of idea, certainly in the genre I, I write in, that if you're re- if you're reading this, then you expect some sort of basically British medieval history with elves, mm-hmm. which is fine. <laughs> but I think it's after a while, it's 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 something. It's it's a it's a certain it's a weird kind of conditioning growing up with the, in your entire years, 20, 30, 40 years regarding art that you're not in. Mm-hmm. And 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 not having the place of taking it for granted that there's a certain kind of artistic history of the world that a huge part of the world doesn't, you know, doesn't read. And it's not, and again, uh, uh, Jericho made this point. These books are out there. It's not like I woke up this morning and Charles Saunders didn't exist before me, uh, you know, Octavia Butler. But um, for me, at least, it was sort of uh, writing in a way, and, it, and the one thing it has in common with the other books I write, regardless of genre, is writing as response to erasure. And I think regardless of, of, of the genre, and in fact, I think the genre is the point, and I think it is, that um, if, if, if one person in picking up fantasy don't imagine it, it's going to be some blonde elf saying words that betwixt, which nobody says, um, you know, then, you know, then some of the work is done. Yeah. yeah. So look, um, when I was three years old, uh, Spin a Soft Black Song by Nikki Giovanni was on my bookshelf. When I was four years old, I was reading Lucille Clifton's Everett Anderson series, four or five books featuring a boy who looked like me. Mm-hmm. I read John Steptoe's Stevie in Uptown. Um, I marveled at the pictures in the poem and the sun guy said that's hit by Ernest Gray. My bookshelves were lined with books written by black people illustrated by black people. In my opinion, the reason why the, the, it's, it's important for the work that we're doing is because it allows you as a black person to, to, to buy into this notion that I am the greatest, not because I am better than anyone, but because no one is better than me. And the way you learn that is by seeing yourself as everybody's been alluding to on the page is by is by is by hearing yourself on the page is by seeing and learning and loving and realizing that your stories matter and that they are important that's where the centering comes in it comes in being able to the mind of an adult begins in the imagination of a child you want to create adults who know their worth, who know their value. I posit it begins in childhood. And that's why these books, these poems, these stories are not just important. They're, they're life giving and life saving. So I'll just say that um, <clears throat> echoing Marlon, uh, I wrote the book that I wanted to read and that I looked for and couldn't find. Um, and in the, the, the field that I, you know, work on, there's been, you know, there've been tons of books, um, written about race and and housing, uh, but done in such a way that even though they're, they're technically about black people, black people are just kind of, uh, a generic backdrop, um, to really talk about, uh, other things. Um, and this was particularly the case uh, with housing, where, you know, we all get used to the descriptions of inequality as, uh, you know, housing, education, uh, jobs, and some constellation uh, of that without really looking intimately at what that actually looks like. Um, and so I wanted to look inside of um, the homes of uh, Black women in particular, 
uh, as, as being evocative of a deeper problem. Um, and so I, I do that and I'm able to, to look at uh, housing inequality as a catalyst um, for black protests, for black riots, for black rebellion, um, but also to look at the ways that black women in particular, uh, who my history is kind of built around um, and look at their activism in a different kind of way, uh, which is not tied to organizations, which is not tied to uh, traditional ways in which we understand um, activism or the ways in which politics register, uh, but look at their willingness to speak, um, to talk about their own experiences, which become a foundation <laughs> for understanding uh, scandals and fraud in a federal uh, program that was intended to create uh, or transform low-income Black renters into Black homeowners uh, and to look at the way that um, that program instead became a, a new conduit for exploitative real estate practices that uh, used race as a um, means of exploitation. Uh, and so that was an, another uh, feature that was important to me, uh, was to not just see segregation um, as uh, just reflective of the uh, individual choices and desires of white people and whether they wanted black neighbors or not, um, but to really understand the economy built around uh, the segregation and exploitation uh, of black people and to bring the uh, institutional weight of banks and the real estate industry into our understanding and into our lexicon uh, of uh, exploitation, of segregation, um, and, and really uh, to deepen our understanding of uh, what happened to Black communities and to Black uh, uh, neighborhoods over time as some context for understanding these issues, uh, persisting issues of housing inequality long after the laws had been changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I suspect you all would have known the value of your work one way or the other, right? Whether or not the world received how valuable your work is, but prizes and accolades, these come into play, right? But what, and you're all here because of the National Book Awards, right? Because of the relationship with the National Book Awards, that's what this panel is um, uh, based on. What, um, what do they matter? What does it mean to sort of be considered, considered expert, to win a Booker Prize, to win a Pulitzer Prize, to be a bestseller, to be in the homes of millions of children? You know, what does it mean? <laughs> that's not what I'm asking, Jericho. Um, <laughs> but what does it mean? You know, it, it, Octavia Butler recently made it onto the bestseller list, The Parable of the Sower, which was something that she had written down as a wish, you know, mm. and it had never happened. It happened, it happened now, it happened in 2020. What does it mean to be of a generation where this is happening more frequently? I mean, again, I don't mean to keep asking questions about business, because I'm really asking about what it means, you know, does it change, does reach change? Does it have a big, having a bigger black audience and easier to find black audience, having a youth whose teachers are bringing these books into the classroom, does it change something for you? You know, I know for me, you know, particularly in Kianga's case, you know, to, to see somebody talking about policy and fraud and revolution and rebellion and writing in a different context and actually to be expert, to be in an Ivy League university, to be considered, you know what I mean? That's different. It was not absent. You've all talked about how there were people that came before you and there were, there were people on my bookshelf too, but it's different now. And what is that platform? What is that power perhaps or not? You can question it. What does it mean? What does it mean for what comes next? What do places like the MBF, what responsibility does the foundation have? Do all of these organizations have? Um, I think, I mean, different, different things for, for, well, they're connected, even though they're slightly different for readers uh, as they're, they're for writers. I think, um, you know, think about a bestseller best list. If you take it too seriously when you're on them, you're going to take it very seriously when you're not. Mm -hmm. And and that and and you know there's still there's still something very fickle about that and um, you know and you know I mean it took me what 15 years to be at, get on one, um, but at the same time you know I remember once um, 
totally out of totally out of out of the way analogy. Somebody asked Kurt Cobain about um, Walmart censoring his album cover, and mm-hmm. does he have a problem with that? And he was like, "Hell no, I don't." Because back when I was a kid, Walmart was all there was. So if 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 the album didn't appear in Walmart, I wouldn't see it. It's nice to to boost my indie cred, but if the if the mainstream store or the the, the, the sort of mainstream markers didn't exist, a lot of those people who need the stuff wouldn't you know wouldn't you know wouldn't get it. I would say like uh, you know. Fine, we can talk all I want about, you know, Lupita Nyong'o and the cover of Vogue if it means anything. But if you're 13 years old in, in, in certain communities, that cover is what you got. And I think that if if that if the, the best service being the way it is um brings more access, then I think I think that's a great thing. I think it's great. I think that um you know why wouldn't Octavia Butler have that. It's like when, when Erica Badu said, yes, my album sold because I planned it. Mm-hmm. She's like, why would I plan not to do well? <laughs> I never forgot that. She said, she said that what, 1988? I mean, I never, amen. I never forgot it. Um, and, I, and I do believe that. And I, and I, and I do um, think about, people should think about that and, 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 and the sales and so on. Um, I think for, for writers, I think I've been in this long enough to remember when I was not considered a writer with potential and not considered a writer who the book industry could place anything on. You know, mm-hmm. I ran into an editor of a major publishing house um, a few years ago and he's like, I never forgot your debut novel. And I'm like, then why didn't you publish it? <laughs> like, I mean, Listen. all these years you can still quote my book back to me, but you have all this laundry list of reasons why. And, um, and, you know, I mean, man, I wish I was a bigger kind of person who's not petty. But, yeah, I do like thinking of the, eight, the 16 people who turned on my second novel and the 78 people who turned on my first and go, yeah, you did wrong. And, I mean, I'm not, the, the, the bigger point being that I do think that we're in a situation where it's far more likely that a book like my first book can get published now than say even 15 years ago right. and I do notice it I'm, I'm in it long enough to notice to notice the difference you know there are certain books I mean I cannot imagine Luster coming out in 2002 I cannot imagine it and, and I think that's uh, or 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 C. Pam Zhang's book I just can't imagine these books being around um, other than by really dedicated indie publishers um, and big up to them because God knows that's why that's certainly why I am here and that's why some of us are been here long enough to enjoy this moment. But um, it is absolutely absolutely different, I think. Well, I just need to be bestseller list. You know, you guys are all doing. You're everybody's running a different race. So you can talk about this question in whatever way. It's just about sort of expertise, recognition, awards, bestseller list. However you want to look at it. I mean, I'll. I'll say that I was pretty shocked <laughs> about the reception for uh, Race for Profit. I mean, my first two books uh, did well, but at, you know, for a, a specific kind of audience on the left, you know, to be to be honest uh, about it. Um, but for this book. Um, you know, a long list for the National Book Award, a finalist for the Pulitzer, you know, that's, that was beyond um, anything that, that I thought about. Not because, you know, I thought I wrote a good book. I, I was, you know, like I said, I wrote the book that I was interested in reading. Um, but I do think that that, you know, says something about uh, that a book like that can be uh, received um, by a fairly broad audience, um, I think speaks to an opening that exists right now uh, that, you know, is not just about the quality of, of the work, but there's uh, people like you and, and you know, well-placed people in publishing and, uh, and um in these contests who 
are open and receptive to looking at things in a much broader way and looking and valuing the perspective of um, black people and other marginalized voices that have otherwise, you know, in other uh, periods, because these sorts of things, there's been an, an effort to uh, write these histories, these uh, poems, literatures into uh, existence over time, but uh, you have to have people who receive them uh, and who help create the space for <laughs> them to be received. Um, and so I think that uh, there's something happening in, in publishing, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, has helped to open the space um, for that. And I think, you know, it's good. And, and for me, it's helped, uh, it's helped me um, speak to a broader uh, audience. Uh, you know, I'm writing regularly for The New Yorker um, now, and that's obviously directly connected to the reception and success of uh, Race for Profit. And, you know, I'm aware of that. I'm, I'm appreciative uh, of that. And I hope to, uh, to be able in my own way to clear some space for other uh, voices like ours to um, have some space in the world to talk about our experiences. Mm -hmm. Just so, jumping in really quickly to say that you all have given such beautiful work that being able to, our job is to take these books and amplify them. And it has been so extraordinary over the past couple of years to have such incredible work that's different from the work that an organization like ours might have seen. And to be able to do that work inside of communities, it's a huge, huge, huge tool. So we're just really grateful. But that's that's just Jericho, please. Well, what I, I was actually going to say exactly what you just said. Um, the position or the expertise puts you in a place, hopefully, where instead of one, you know, running behind being your own publicist, you can actually really spend more time getting good writing done. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it puts you in a position where that good writing will appear in places where people will see it without you literally uh, emailing it to every one of your friends one by one. So that is a wonderful uh, thing because then I have more time to actually focus on the writing. Um, right. I also, but I also think um, for me, it's been really strange because, you know, I'm a big fan of Two Trains Running by, by August Wilson. And I, I think as Black people, uh, there has to be those of us who are really interested in a complete and total 100% upending of every system we know. And then there has to be those of us who work within those systems uh, in some way to prove uh, to one another um, throughout that, oh, I can sing, I can dance, I can write, I can, <laughs> I can get us to the moon. I, do, you, do you follow what I'm saying? So right. but that really gets, and then what really happens, I think as for me as a black writer, maybe not for everybody, is that you find both of those people working in one person and they're often like beating each other up. Like what you gonna do? How you gonna handle this? What's up? You know what I mean? So um, there's a way that, um, you know, uh, I, if I'm writing for the New York Times, I need to find a way to say that I understand that the New York Times uh, has, it, even if I'm not writing about this particular thing, because I'm writing for the New York Times, I need to find a way to say that the New York Times has been irresponsible uh, in so many ways as it relates to race and particularly as it relates to our, our, um, our, our politics and our government at this moment, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that I think um, gets a little bit more difficult uh, after having a Pulitzer Prize, because I want the New York Times to keep writing, but I also want to be, to always, uh, to keep asking me to write, but I also want to always be telling the truth, no matter how uh, painful that truth may be to some. Yeah, I think uh, the people who, I think the awards and the New York Times, the seller list and the accolades is, 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 is a wonderful thing for the people in our lives. It's like a, a huge thank you to our family, um, our, our supporters, our friends, our mentors. Um, my father, you know my dad, Lisa, my dad. I do. Oh my God, my father is constantly, you know, he's like, send me the New York Times. I, I didn't get the list this week. Did you make the list? He sent me flowers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I got, long listed for the National Book Award, he sent you flowers. 
<laughs> but what I met him, he said, how come my son wasn't on the stage? Yeah, well, we ain't got to say that. I was laughing. That, he's, he's the best. Watching. I Don't love call him, him so out. much. I Don't love call him, him so out. much. He's my favorite. Um, That's what he's supposed to be. When I won the Newberry, I went to, uh, he was the first call I made. And then the second thing I did was I drove to Christiansburg mm -hmm. to see Nikki. And she was in the hospital. And so I get to the hospital room. Because, of course, I want to let her know. I want to let this woman who showed me how to write, who gave me the, the, the license to do what I do creatively, I wanted, to, I wanted to share that with her. And she was in the hospital bed. She was sleeping. And I just sat there. And when she woke up, she was like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I won the Newberry. And she says, well, I guess I need to get well then. Uh. <laughs> and, and then... When Jericho won the Pulitzer, Nikki's calling me and she's like, Jericho won the Pulitzer. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And she's like, well, we got to do something. I'm like, what are we going to do? And so she's like, we got to buy an ad in the New York Times to celebrate <laughs> Jericho's win of the Pulitzer. I'm like, Nikki, do you know how much the ads in the New York Times cost? She's like, it doesn't matter. We all going to chip in matter. and buy an ad for Jericho. So okay. it's just that that idea that the people who are in our community and what it means to them, I think is pretty powerful. Jerry, now you're gonna have me crying too. I mean, you know, I think that um, it is like family. You know, I made that joke, I'm sorry, but, mm -hmm. said, but it's just like, it's like when we don't do right, when we do beautiful things or when organizations don't do right, I should say, yeah. it's a real family thing. And I think that it's been amazing to watch the community grow. It's real. And the support. And I think that it's that's the takeaway I've gotten over the past five years of watching how this all works so deeply is that the family is bigger now. Absolutely. And in a lot of ways. So we're um, going to move to questions. Um, so Kwame, this one's you for right, you. Bro? You all right, man? I know. You all right? <laughs> we love you, Jericho. It's real talk. and love. Forever. <laughs> um, so Kwame, thank you so much for sharing that. And these are questions from the audience. Uh, somebody says, Kwame, thank you so much for sharing that anecdote about your daughter having to apologize to the white girl. My question involves BIPOC participation in these neoliberal pedagogical spaces where tokenism is all but unavoidable because yo, on the real, I'm not trying to have combos with white liberal educators anymore about diversity or inclusion. Any thoughts? Um, no. Which I didn't see coming. <laughs> I feel like, hey, I I feel your pain. I would, I'll just say this. Um, no, we are not responsible for educating white folks. Um, but perhaps it may be our role or some of our roles. Because if you think about it, we each have PhDs in, in carrying the weight of being Black. From the time that we were born, <laughs> we each have an, a, an understanding of what it means to see those flashing blues um, in our rearview mirror. Um, we each understand how it feels to have um, uh, someone, some white person uh, rub their hands through our daughter's hair and how that feels. We each have this understanding of what it means to be black in America. And so if, if anybody understands that, it's us. So I think, yeah, it may not be our responsibility, but we the experts. Can I add, can I add something? I also mm -hmm. want to say that there are always places where white people can indeed be referred to go. and. And, um, you know, there's, uh, this is why I get really upset with Black people who think it's okay to say that, um, that Black people can get, be racist. I'd be wanting to fight. I'd be wanting to fight them, fight us. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there's a National Book Award finalist uh, who's a historian who thinks Black people can be racist, and I'd be wanting to fight him, like literally. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, there is no Black institution that has been built to keep white people out. There are very few spaces that we call black where white people just can't go. If white people wanna go to a black club, 
Black people who see them in the club and actually get excited about their presence. If white people want to sing Black music, Black people think they can really sing. They just sing in regular Black. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to take the class in African American studies, we are happy to have you in our course on African American studies. So there's a way that um, the direction, like, if you want to know more about Black life, that's a matter of being around black people. And black people generally have no trouble with accepting the fact they might not even like it, but they we deal with it pretty well when black folks, when white folks come around, you know, we right. speak, we might offer them food. Like, so I don't get this whole, I don't have this experience. White people are like, oh, what do I do and where do I find it? And I'm like, go outside. Mm -hmm. All these <laughs> Like seriously, there was a protest in every city this summer. Yeah. And you I don't know the you, you can't learn nothing from no black people about nothing. They leave that to watching episodes of The Wire. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, so we're gonna go to the next one. Uh, Toshi says, "Y'all are beautiful." As black writers, I think T O C H I. Um, as black writers. I don't think it's Toshi Regan. Uh, could you talk about your relationship to or battle against the idea that duty to write duty to write about certain characters or certain topics because of your blackness? Hey, look, Jericho got a line in in a poem. I want to say it's called Hustle. He says, "Let me try to. I don't. I want to misquote you, but whatever. It's uh, it's uh, I eat humans. I I eat I eat with humans." who see any book full of black characters as being about race or something to that effect. That's right. And mm -hmm. I suggest that <laughs> we, should be, we should be able to write about the things that we want to write about. Mm -hmm. I wrote a novel called The Crossover and it was about two black boys and their father and their mother and their friendship and their jealousy and their competition and their crushes and 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 their and their lives. And mm -hmm. this teacher, this teacher in many in Minnesota, she emailed me. She said, "I at no point in at, at no point in the book did I say that I that I used the letters B L A C K." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Teacher emailed me from Minnesota. She says, "Kwame." But I'm going to teach your book in my class. Before I teach it, I need to know what color the boys are in the book. And I said, what do you mean you need to know? She said, well, my kids, my students are going to ask. I said, I doubt your students are going to ask. Um, but if they do, email me back and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, right. So she, she emailed me back, y'all, and she says, Kwame, you're right. <laughs> The kids, the kids didn't ask, <laughs> and, and I and so two things. I said, of course, the kids didn't ask because it's not the kids that are the problem. It's the adults. Listen. The book, it's the adults that are the problem. Like you can't see a black boy laughing and loving and walking and living and dancing and thinking and being as just a kid. You can't see that. You somehow have to ascribe these other boxes to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I don't know, that's just my two cents. That's my little yeah. anecdote about it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, um, don't, I don't feel a, a, a duty. Um, I've, I feel, you know, I have interest in all, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and I, I don't know, I write about the, the things that I find uh, compelling and that I have questions about. I mean, that's usually where uh, a writing project starts for me is I have a question that I'm trying to figure out. Um, and, you know, I go, I go from, from there. And um, most times it, it actually, yes, it involves uh, black people in, in some form or another, but I don't, I guess I don't feel like that um, feels like an obligation or a burden uh, or anything like that. I mean, it's it's my experience. It's the the world uh, around me. It's my family. 
Um, and for me, that's often where my questions begin. Um, and, and that, that doesn't, I don't know, that doesn't feel um, particularly heavy uh, to me. It feels, it feels like um, almost like a, a gift, you know, yeah. to be able uh, to be able to engage and to think about these things and then to be expressive about it. To that idea of duty, you know, I think people sometimes think it's so weird that it might be a choice, you know, that we might choose to write a verse. Like, why wouldn't we want to be mainstream? When and enjoyable. We, you know, <laughs> and enjoyable, right? Like, why wouldn't that be something, you know? And, and how do you answer that when people sort of are surprised that you don't do something else since you could or that you couldn't do something else that you must? I don't know if that's too weird of like too convoluted of a question. I, I just I just wanted to say to this that um you know there I mean I could be wrong about this because I haven't read it in like a year but and I used to read it every year so it's, it's coming up time I guess but um you know there aren't any black people in Giovanni's role mm -hmm. and um but I know that <laughs> I've never encountered it or read it if it weren't written by a black man. Mm -hmm. It would <laughs> if James Baldwin hadn't written Giovanni's Room, I wouldn't know what Giovanni's Room was. Right. Um, and I also think the fact of that black man's life, you know, uh, who he spent time with, the fact that he wanted to go talk to Elijah Muhammad, the fact that he wanted to go to the South and talk to the people who were in the midst of the movement, the fact of uh, his life in Harlem. Um, I think those things, I'm much more interested in how I live my life and who's in my life and what my life looks like, you know? Um, and the question is, am I trying hard at that? Like, is it a, do I have to put on my list of things to do, hang out with black people? <laughs> or are there black people in my life? <laughs> do you know? And I feel like you, if you really have that relationship to black folk, you don't have to worry about the responsibility stuff. Mm -hmm. right? Cause you're going to be writing what you love based on having been around who you love. But you gotta love us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just yeah. echoing what everybody said. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> this is like, so, it's like food. Um, Marlon mentioned books. Uh, Marlon mentioned, sorry, I'm reading the question. Let's skip that one. Uh, I'm a white woman over 60. I come from a culture that didn't read. I'm a slow, poor reader and have found in the past few years that audiobooks um, are places that I can learn about history and stories I could never find enough of. What audiobook platforms pick up your books other than the Amazon version? Oh, well, if you can pop your email address in the um, comments, I will write you back with some ideas for that, unless anybody has something they want to add. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, so Marlon mentioned that books paved or mentioned books that, uh, that, he, that, that your work has paved the way for, uh, Raven Lalani, C. Pam Zhang, are any other debut authors y'all would like to give some airspace or recommend? Okay. <laughs> Anybody, y'all love it? Y'all reading, reading books? Young, any books? You got some book recs. Bring me the book recs. Can I just say, I mean, this is, this is an old book and I read it every year because I teach it uh, every year. But uh, Khalil Muhammad's The Condemnation of Blackness is the best book ever written on the conflation of race and crime in the United States. And if you want to understand and know where this link between blackness and criminality comes from, um, you have to read his book. And I'm just, you know, I read it, I've read it every year for the last five years. And every time I read it, I, it feels like it's new uh, to me again. And I learned something from it. And so, um, new on. practice. What's it called? It's called The Condemnation of Blackness, mm -hmm. Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern America. It's extraordinary. Amazing. Thank you. So anybody else, it doesn't have to be a debut, just like maybe one book that you think is really important. 
This is John Murillo's new book. It's called Contemporary American Poetry, and he's got K's where they're supposed to be C's. Um, <laughs> this is a book by Brenda Shaughnessy that I love. Mm -hmm. It's called The Octopus Museum. It's real good. Um, I'm putting away these other... Oh, look, it's a book by Claudia Rankin. Never heard of her. Uh, this is a book by Srikanth Reddy. It's called Underworld Lit. This is a book by a writer whose last name I really don't know how to pronounce, but her name is Candace. I guess that's Wule. There's also new books by, there's a new book by Yona Harvey, and I'm not remembering the title, but if y'all look up Yona Harvey, you can get her new book. As a matter of fact, um, I think all of the books that Four Way put out most, most recently, sort of the, I guess the 20, the 2019, 2020 books by Four Way are really good. Um, yeah, so those are some books. That's great. Beautiful. Um, I'll let you offer, yeah, I was just saying that, you know, it, it's, I saw an article recently, I bought an author, we, we, we have him been reading Gail Jones. And man, if that, if that gets anybody to read her, that'd be so fantastic. Eva's man, Corrigia, I can never pronounce that, it's Corrigadora. Corrigadora. Eva's man is kind of my favorite, but, um, you know, this is, Toni Morrison wasn't just a brilliant writer, she also had brilliant taste. And a lot of these writers, Tony Kidd, Bambara, um, and 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 uh, Gail Jones are people that that um, you know that have benefited from Tony Morrison's pen. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think if you know those books, it's particularly those two, um, if you should grab them and read them, there really is nothing in American that quite like it. Amazing, thank you. How about some for the kids? Anything? Yeah, I mean, I think you know. Uh, there's a young writer, debut author named Kwame Mbalia, mm -hmm. and uh, he writes fantasy. Yeah. Um, and he writes fantasy with African myths and folklore. Um, his first novel was called Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. Mm. And his, it's a great title. Yeah, and his second one is Tristan Strong, I think, destroys the world. It comes out on Tuesday. So... Certainly, I would recommend him, Kwame Mbalia. Beautiful. Well, that's a great list of books for folks to read. And that actually concludes our time. Um, so I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to all four of these extraordinary authors. Um, this is the last time I get to do this panel with the outgoing crop of, you know, 2019 folks. And so I'm a little emotional, but I've been proud to be a tiny part of all of your journeys. And um, this work is strong and I think it's changing the world and it's part of a long tradition and part of an even longer future. And I think that's really incredible. Um, <clears throat> Greenlight is selling the books. So please click that link and buy these books. They're not only great books and bookstores not only need income, but this is important. It's important right now to support and to learn and to read and to do more you know, we need to spend time with these words. They spent lots of time writing them. Um, we will see you hopefully on Tuesday um, at the National Book Foundation for this year's finalists, which we'll be announcing at nationalbook.org. And I hope we see you there. And in the meantime, thank you so much for supporting the Brooklyn Book Festival, these authors, Greenlight, and for enriching your lives with books. Thank you. <laughs>